Good afternoon, Red Church. It is good to be in God's house. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here today. Thank you all who are online. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I just want to say that this morning when we were in um, Breakfast with Jesus, one of the questions asked, what difference does it make that Jesus is alive? And I thought about that question and I said, because he lives, I get to live. And that brought joy to my heart this morning. Anybody excited that because Jesus lives, you live? That dead situation that had no hope now lives. Your, the fact that you had no joy, now your joy can live. Anybody want to just thank God? Just give a praise. Thank you, Lord. Because he lives, we get to live. Can we stand up and just um, pray this morning? Let's go to, the, go to before the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, that because Jesus lives, we live, Lord. We had no hope before, but because Jesus died and resurrected, we now have hope, new hope, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have new breath in our lungs this morning, God. Thank you, Lord, that you spoke to every dead situation that we went through this week, Lord, and you speak life to it. Thank you, Lord God, that you gave us the ability of our limbs this morning. Thank you, Lord God, you gave us hope, Lord, in a hopeless situation. Thank you, Lord God, that even though we may have walked in here sad or, or weighed down by the world, Lord, we pray and we're, we declare, Lord, that we aren't going to leave the same way, Lord. So we invite your spirit into this place, Lord God. You're already here. We just ask that you will fill us up, Lord God. Change our mind, change our thoughts, open our eyes, open our ears, that we don't miss the blessing that you have for us this morning, Lord God. This is your service, Lord. We are your people. We surrender our hearts to you. And we surrender this service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Old Testament scripture, Isaiah 11, 1 through 9. In today's reading from the Old Testament, we see a glimpse of what life was like in Eden before Adam sinned. This is not, however, a look back, but a look ahead to the new Eden, ushered in by Christ, the second Adam. The branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath on his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around the waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand onto the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on any my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Amen.
Our New Testament scripture this morning is from Revelation 5, 1 to 10. In the book of Revelation, we read that the Apostle John's stunning account of the entrance of the much-anticipated Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, who in a shocking twist appears in the form of a sacrifice lamb, the scroll and the lamb. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept. And I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him, right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We're going to pray for our congregation, for our community, and for the work of God in this earth. Amen. Oh, Lord, today I stand before you and I lift up your people to you. We lift up our prayers and we know that they come before you as incense that are pleasing to you. And God, I pray first for our congregation, for our people here right now that have committed their lives to following you. I pray that our eyes will be open, that we will not be deceived by all the things around us, that we will not look to, to false lions to find our power, but oh God, we would come before your throne, the lion who is the lamb, Jesus who was slain for us, Lord, that we would stand in your resurrection power, that resurrection life church would be full of your life, oh God, and that we would be a transformed people. I pray today for those in our congregation, in our city that follow you, that are suffering, Lord, where the enemy is just going after them where there's deception and where there's blindness and where there's confusion. God, we know you are not the God of confusion. You are the God of truth. And we pray that your truth would break through, that your light would break through. Lord, that you would provide comfort for those who are suffering so that they would not grow faint, but that they would be full of your power and strength even as they endure to the end. Oh, God, be with your church, I pray. Be with the churches of this city. All who call upon King Jesus, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit. And, Lord, that they would see clearly who you are. For the churches of our nation and of this world, oh, God, may we see you clearly. Lord, convict us when we look around at our culture and we say that if we just do that, that you would be glorified. If we just do this, you would be glorified. May we never move away from you, Jesus. Let us see you as you are, the all-powerful who made himself powerless on our behalf. Oh, God, may we walk in the way of the cross that leads to the kingdom. Oh, God, may we not serve idols of this world, but may we bow before your throne. And, Lord, when we're discouraged, let us remember that today, even now, there are people beyond around the throne praising you because you are worthy, worthy, worthy are you, O oh Lord. Worthy is the Lamb of God. We pray for your church, God. Convict us when we're wrong and teach us how to see you clearly. And Lord, for those who do not know you yet, oh God, we pray that we, you would fill us with your spirit 
And as we speak the word, as we teach the word, oh, Lord, that your spirit would bring conviction and freedom because you are the God who frees us from the sin that so tangles us and messes us up, oh, God. We pray for your freedom. We pray that people would be delivered. Oh, Lord, for those who are in bondage by the demonic, we pray in the name of Jesus you would deliver them. For those who are trapped by sickness that leads them to despair, we pray, God, for healing so that your name would be known and you would bring deliverance. Oh, God, anoint your people to speak clearly. And, Lord, may you begin to work in hearts and minds and bring many to your kingdom so we would glorify you, oh, Jesus. And finally, we remember those who have already been sent out into the mission fields of this world. We pray especially for those who live in places that are dark spiritually, that have not yet heard the gospel of freedom. We pray that you would give courage and conviction, O oh God, that your presence would guide and direct, and that you would bless your servants as they preach your name, O oh God. Bless missionaries, bless those that serve out of this congregation, O oh God, that the name of God would go forth. And we ask today as we get ready to hear the word shortly that the eyes of our heart would be opened and that we would see you and that we would worship you, the lion and the lamb. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. It's great to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you're here? I certainly am. Glad that you're here. I'm glad that I'm here too, but I'm really glad to see everyone here this morning. We want to give a thank you and a shout out to our prayer partners, those of you in this room and those who may be watching on YouTube, uh, just to keep you abreast of the things that we as the leadership team are praying for right now. Um, we have a housing need among our church and academy family. Things are moving in that direction, but we want to make sure that uh, everything is happening on God's schedule um, and, and God's provision. So please continue to pray for that. Uh, April, you're going to be hearing a lot about missions this month. We will have missionary guests. And we don't want it just to be uh, we support them by our prayers. We support them by our finances, although they certainly need that. We also want to have that prayer that Isaiah had, here am I, send me. Lord, how do you want to get me involved in missions? So as you hear about missionaries, as you see um, videos, and as we have uh, missionary guests come and join with us, you know, just ask God to stir your heart. You can be a missionary in your office, um, at, at school, on the block where you live, with your family. But God is also calling you to other missionaries, you know, there's missions, to short-term missions, uh, to long-term missions. And we just want to see uh, more people called out of this church. Please pray for our spring musical and fundraiser. Thank the Lord for this opportunity that he has given to us. Um, not only do we want to raise uh, awareness and raise funds for the performing arts program, but we also want to introduce people to Jesus. So pray that this would be a time where he would be glorified. And uh, as always, pray for missionaries missionary or laborers in this field as we see people graduate on to other areas of ministry. Uh, we just thank God because we know that he's got some other people lined up as well. So thank you so much for praying with us um, on that behalf. And thank you also for your faithfulness in BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. This is something that we believe in very strongly. It helps missionaries out on the field get funds that they need for special projects. Um, so as children bring in their coins, their buddy barrels, uh, adults, you know, feel free to do that as well. Um, to, to bring in your, your offering, we are able to support missions in that way. And this is something that this church has been very strong in throughout its history. And I thank you so much for that. And you're going to be hearing a lot about faith promise giving this month. And I want to ask you to uh, start praying, please, about faith promise. And what faith promise is, it's not me telling you this is our missions budget and this is how much we have to raise, so how much can you have? It's not you looking at your bank account, looking at your weekly income and saying, this is what I can afford to give. This is something between you and God. This is you talking to God and saying, Lord, I want to support missions. Please tell me how much you want me to give. And God will give you that answer. And it's not based on you know what you think the church needs or what you think you can afford, but it's saying, Lord, as you provide, uh, I want to give this amount of missions to, to missions every week or every month. Now, we ask you to fill out a faith promise card. We'll ask that at the end of the missions convention so that we can plan um, every year how many missionaries we can support uh, and at what level. But this isn't the kind of thing where we say, you told us you were going to give a dollar a week and we didn't get that dollar. You know, we're going to take you to court, small claims court and gather. No, this is something between you and God. Um, so I would ask you just to, to make that contact with God. Begin praying even now so that when we um, ask for those faith promise cards, uh, you know, you, your family will know how much that you are going to be giving to missions, and then we can uh, make our planning accordingly. So again, at this time, just asking you to pray and ask God how much you can, uh, he wants you to, to contribute to missions. This is something that Candace and I will be doing as well. 
And we have new missionaries of this month, the DiMartinos. You're going to get to meet them on the 21st. And again, I'm going to ask you a favor, and I've asked this in the past, and you've been so gracious and generous. Uh, please come prepared to give on Missionary Sunday on uh, April 21st. Um, so that's two Sundays from today. Uh, we want to send them away with a great offering to let them know that we in Philadelphia are we're supporting them with our prayers, but we also want to give them the financial support that they've needed. Um, I don't feel bad asking you about that because I've asked before, and you've been very uh, generous in responding towards that. So just respond the way that you always have, and we will be able to bless the, uh, the DiMartinos. So as always, you can give online, give.reslife.us. You can use a credit card, a debit card, or have it taken directly from your bank account there. Uh, same thing with uh, texting, 215-309-9092. Uh, or you can give through the app. If you haven't downloaded the app, you can get it at app.reslife.us. There's also a box in the back, and at this time, um, Ms. Say is coming forward to uh, help you to put your offering in the plate. Lord, we thank you so much that you give us the opportunity to participate in missions with you with this, uh, in this very tangible way and participate in meeting the needs of this church. We ask, Father, that these funds that are used, that are contributed today would be used to your glory, that you would multiply them for the blessings um, of this church and of missionaries here and throughout the world. Amen. Amen. All right. We are going to take opportunity at this point to share the love and the fellowship of Christ. Shake hands with someone you know. Shake hands with someone you don't know. Um, just a time for us to be friendly and get to know each other and, um, again, be the body of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good and all the time. I get the privilege to bring the announcements. And I know sometimes this is where people fall asleep or look in their phone, but if you could stay focused so that we, you can get this important information. If you don't already, please download the church app. That is the way that you can stay connected with us. You'll have the calendar. You can give online, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go ahead and download that today. Also, if you don't have the April Church newsletter, it's one on the back um, table, but that we also have it online, so you can check online for it as well. Our mentions, uh, mission convention begins next Sunday. Make some noise for that. God is so good, and we are a church that believe in sending. So we'll be introducing our theme of sent next Sunday and welcome guest missionaries later in the month. Um, and into May. Stay tuned for emails and social media posts and continue to pray that our hearts are open to hear from God and continue to pray for our missionaries. Also, we are just like two and a half weeks away from Sprouting Remnants musical. So if you don't already have a ticket, please make sure you buy your ticket as soon as possible because seats are filling up and we can only fill up a certain amount, okay? This will help our team and our planning as well. 
Help us prepare the building as an opportunity for you to serve in the church April 18th to the 23rd. We're cleaning, organizing, setting up, just preparing our um, church for receiving our guests and dedicating this time for prayer, okay? We want to saturate this place in prayer because we don't know who's God, who God is going to bring in this room, but we want them to leave out knowing who God is, okay? So we want to dedicate this space for prayer. Last thing before the video shows is in May, we're going to take a pause and we're just going to be praying. We're still getting our theme together, whether it's going to be pray in May or pray May or May pray, whatever it's going to be, we are going to be praying in May. Amen? Let's prepare our hearts for the word after this video. Sprouting Remnants is a story about dreams like seeds planted in the hearts of many, passed down and nurtured by a few, reminding all who will see, all who will hear, that God is good. Sprouting Remnants is a benefit musical supporting the performing arts program at Spring Garden Academy, featuring original music by international composer Victor Manison. Join us April 26 at 7 p.m. to witness and celebrate what God is doing through the youth and children at Spring Garden Academy. To support, visit our website and purchase a ticket. Or if you like to donate, donate by texting GIVE to 215-608-5595. Sprouting Remnant Musical is showing one night only, April 26th at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Hope you all are getting excited about that. All right, so, um, there we go. That's my dog, Coco. She's, uh, she's just a little thing. And if you're family, she's not really threatening. She is very gentle. You know, sometimes we play with her, we try to get her to bite us. She absolutely refuses to bite us. That's like the line that she won't cross. She's just a nice, gentle, wonderful, little comfort dog. But she's got this stealth mode. Sometimes she becomes stealth dog. Like Friday night, I was coming out of the kitchen, and all of a sudden, Coco was there, right? I didn't see her, and it, it kind of startled me, and, it, and it, well, I wasn't expecting her. Now, she's you know, not even knee-high. She's just a little thing, and she's not dangerous. I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I wasn't expecting her, and it scared me. So, this is the shortest and probably the worst introduction I've ever given to a message before, but we are going to talk about being scared, a time when people were scared, particularly Jesus' disciples were scared, because they weren't expecting to see him. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. This is just after what you looked at at uh, Breakfast with Jesus this morning, and we're going to be looking at Jesus the Lamb. So would you stand with me, please, as we read this scripture? All right, Jesus appears to the disciples. What, what side should I be on? Okay. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he, told them, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. I like the fact that um, Luke gives us a little bit of context. If you remember you know, the, the story of the, the disciples in the garden when they fell asleep, um, the other gospels say that they fell asleep. Luke actually gives us the detail. They fell asleep because they were overwhelmed by um, everything that had been happening. And here, they didn't believe that it was he because of the joy and amazement. It was an emotional response rather than a spirit or a rational response. All right. Then he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and will and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
Before you seated, please join me in this prayer based on Psalm 119, verse 18. O Lord, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So reach, teach, mend, and send. Um, even though this is a prelude to the Great Commission when Jesus sends it, the, the apostles out, we're not going to be talking about send today, and send's partner is reach. That's where this ultimately is leading, but we're not looking at reach or teach in this passage, um, or reach or send. There is some teaching here, so we will look at that, but mainly the thrust of this passage is mend. Okay, so here are the disciples. Uh, they were expecting Jesus. They were not expecting him to die. They were surprised when he came back to life, and now he's giving them some instruction, but mainly he's preparing to equip them for what's coming up ahead when they're going to have to take over the ministry that he launched with them. So let's see how that goes. So they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. It's a little bit unusual, isn't it? You see Jesus and you think that you're seeing a ghost. Now, granted, the disciples had seen some amazing things. They had seen demons being cast out. So I guess, you know, to them, a ghost wouldn't be that far from the realm of possibilities. But it is kind of strange. Jesus appeared and they didn't recognize him. And as we were saying, this was because they weren't expecting him. Right? They were not expecting to see Jesus. And we're not expecting somebody. Then all of a sudden, when that person comes, it can be strange. It can be a shock, just as it was to me. You know, I, I see my dog. I know that there aren't a lot of four-legged creatures walking around our house, so it had to be my dog, although we have had two dead possums in the 20 years that we've lived in this house, right? But it was, I was still, it was still unexpected and a shock. It took me a, t a second to register that it was actually Jesus. Um, so, yeah. So they didn't recognize the fact that they were seeing Jesus. There have been other encounters uh, where people have not recognized Jesus when they saw him. And in particular, remember when Saul was on the road to Damascus. He was going out to persecute Christians, and then he actually met Jesus. Okay? And he was shocked, and he was appalled, and he says, who is this? And Jesus said, it is I, the Lord, whom you are persecuting. So Saul was not expecting to see Jesus. He was not expecting that encounter with Jesus. And even more than that, he didn't recognize Jesus. Now think about what happened with Saul. I'm sorry, Christian, I'm blocking your view here. I can't stand still. Think about what happened with Saul, though, okay? He thought that he was doing God's work. He thought that by persecuting the people who believed in Jesus that he was doing what God wanted him to do. And God confronted him with the fact that I'm the one whom you're persecuting, right? The person you think you're serving is actually the person whom you are uh, persecuted. So he didn't expect to see Jesus because he thought that Jesus was dead, and he didn't expect the voice of God to be the voice of Jesus because he thought that that was somebody different. Now, Paul was very fortunate that he had this encounter while he was still alive. And it's really going to be horrible on Judgment Day. You know, remember when Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats, and he says, sorry, I never knew you? How many people are going to get to heaven and find out that these people they were persecuting, they were actually persecuting Jesus? And I always want to be careful when I talk about this, but it's true that, I mean, this is something that people need to be confronted with. You know, when we are oppressing the immigrants, when we are oppressing the poor, what does Jesus say? What you did to the least of these, you were doing to me. And people in Christ's name say horrible things about people from other countries, people of other faiths, people with other beliefs, right? People who are poor and they have all these things. We want to shoot them at the border. We want to deport them and all the rest of that. And they're going to stand before God one day, and God's going to say, what you did to them, you were doing to me. So how much better for us to learn to recognize what, who Christ is and what he is doing now, all right, so that we can serve him and worship him now and not be surprised on that day and say, Lord, we did all these things in your name. And he said, no, you were doing those things against me. So Paul was confronted by Jesus. He was confronted by this, this Jesus that he had not seen and he did not know. All right, we also, I think, find ourselves in circumstances where we don't recognize that God is there, that God has been, well, that God is in our presence. We don't recognize God's presence until he shows it to us. All right, how many of you heard this, this phrase, right? God showed up, people give a testimony, and, you know, horrible things were happening, and they were in the depths of the despair, and then all of a sudden, God showed up. And you guys know not to say that to me, right? Because that's a triggering phrase for me. God didn't just show up. 
God was there the whole time. And the fact that we only recognize that when things start going well, that's a problem with us. That's not a problem with God. Right? We are conditioned to think, oh, all of a sudden my financial problems were solved or my health problems are solved, and that's when God showed up. No, God was there all the time. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. See, when God is cutting off those dead branches, when God is pruning like a good gardener, taking out those things in our lives that don't belong there, that are sapping our energy, right, and we're losing money or we're losing our health or we're losing the things that we think are important, we think, oh, where is God? This gardener is so mean. This gardener is from the devil. I'm being so oppressed. But that's God. And then when God nourishes the soil and God waters us, we say, yes, this is God because the blessings are being poured upon me. We need to recognize God when he's pruning, when he's cutting off those branches. We need to recognize that God is there in those times that are difficult for us and not just those times that are good for us. And our example for this is Joseph, way back in the Old Testament. Remember when Joseph was sold by his, 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 his brothers, right? They, they put him in a ditch and they were going to kill him. And it says in, in uh, Genesis chapter 42, 20, remember how distressed he was when he was pleading for his life. All right, so he was at one of his low points. But at some point, he recognized God in his circumstances. He recognized God in the situation. And we can see this as we go forward in the story there. All right, so when he was with Potiphar's wife, Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, he said, how can I do such a thing and sin against God? He was still proclaiming his witness for God. When he got thrown in prison unjustly, he wasn't dejected. He came in and he saw the baker and the butcher, or the king's wine steward and the baker, and he said, how come you guys are so sad today? He was the one who was cheering them up. And then when they said, well, we had these dreams, we don't understand them. Don't all dreams belong to God? The same thing when Pharaoh took him out of the prison and said, I hear that you can interpret dreams. He says, I can't do it, but God can. See, Joseph recognized God even in those situations that were unfair, where he was being unfairly treated. And then we see at the end where God, where Pharaoh made him the second in command and he saved his whole family. What did Joseph say? He said, you intended it for harm, but God intended it for my good. Now, we are going to wallow in self-pity. We're going to be dejected. We're going to be distressed. We're going to be depressed. We're going to be fearful. We're going to be angry, whatever it is, until we recognize God in our situations. The longer we we fail to recognize God, the longer we're going to live in those negative emotions, all right? If we think, oh, I'm being, you know, so mistreated by my coworkers. I'm being so mistreated by my neighbors. Why are all these things happening to me? We are not going to get any victory. If we want to see the kind of victory that Joseph had going from slavery, prison, to being the second in command uh, to Pharaoh, we have to recognize God in those situations. We can't wallow in, why is all this happening to me? We have to see the hand of God. We have to uh, experience, we have to expect the hand of God. Okay. So this is one of my rants. This is not in your notes, nor should it be. But please indulge me as we talk about this. So, what does Jesus say? Jesus in the Beatitudes says, Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you falsely, and say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now that's scripture. This is where the rant begins. So, how many of you ever had a, uh, been to a testimony service, right, where they say, hey, who wants to share what God has done for you? We, we did that on Friday night at Friday Night Prayer. And it was great. It honestly was. It's very encouraging, and it's very necessary for us to hear what God is doing in other people's lives because that encourages us when we're going through similar situations. I mean, I shared something myself, right? But have you ever been to a testimony service where somebody said, well, my coworker lied about me, and praise God, I lost my job because my boss believed him. I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. I lost my insurance, and hallelujah, I don't have a pension anymore. Praise the Lord for the victory, right? But this is what God is telling us. Rejoice when we're being persecuted. Rejoice when those things happen to us. We need to be able to see God in those situations. This is what the disciples did in the book of Acts. They were told, don't preach in the name of God anymore, and they were flogged after they had been thrown in jail. They left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been found worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
as they were suffering, they were praising God for the fact that they were counted worthy of suffering. They saw God in this. They didn't say, oh, Lord, you have to deliver us. We're being so persecuted unmercifully. Why are you letting this happen to us? No, they rejoiced and they praised God. Paul says, in everything, give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not going to say that everything that, you hap that happens to you is what God is deciding to do to you, right? But I will say that it is God's will in those circumstances for you to give praise. We need to be able to recognize God in all of those circumstances so that we can praise God in those circumstances. And again, we don't go from being falsely accused, enslaved, thrown in prison to being the second in command in Egypt by wallowing in our circumstances. No, we go there by praising God, recognizing that he is there and staying faithful to them. So the apostles were surprised they did not expect to see Jesus. In situations where we don't expect to see Jesus, we need to be able to recognize him. This is who God really is. This is God in the middle of our circumstances. All right, let's move on. So, the disciples weren't expecting the Jesus they saw. I don't think that came up in the right sequence, but you know what? I'm going to keep going with it. So what do I mean by that? So Jesus said to them, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and you will see. And the reason that he did this, John gives us a little bit more context when he says, look at my hands and my feet. Remember what John talks about Thomas. Thomas says, when they said, hey, we've seen Jesus. He said, unless I, put my, unless I see the holes in his hands, the nail prints in his hands, and put my, my hand in his thigh, I'm not going to. So this is what Jesus is saying. He's showing them that he's got the nail prints. Yeah, really Jesus, look, you can tell because I've got these nail prints in my hands. I've got these, these nail prints in my feet. And this, does this seem odd to anybody else? Like, Jesus came back from the dead. This is the same Jesus when, you know, somebody struck the, 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 the uh, temple servant in the garden. He healed that person's ear. Jesus came back from the dead, but he still had those scars. Right? Why would Jesus come back with the scars? Why wouldn't he come back in that new body? Remember he told um, Mary, you know, don't touch me because I haven't received my glorified body yet. He was in a different body. They didn't recognize him, but he still had the scars. Why did Jesus still have the scars? This is one of the, I, I love the Bible. This is one of the most beautiful things in all the word of God. And last week when, when Candace told me that she wanted me to read Revelation um, 5, I already knew that I was going to read that this week. And I was trying to find another passage, but no passage sums up the reason for Jesus' scars as much as Revelation 5. Plus, it, it bears reading twice in a row, right? So, why did Jesus still have those scars? Revelation chapter 5, which um, Candace read this morning. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and its seven seals. This is the person that the disciples were expecting. They were expecting the lion of the tribe of David, or of Judah, right? They were expecting David to come with the sword and destroy the Russian enemies, all of the Russian, the Roman enemies all around them, right? But that was the earthly kingdom that they were looking for. Jesus came to proclaim a heavenly kingdom, and he came in the form of a lamb. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures. See, Jesus didn't die to destroy the Romans, to destroy the people, and to make Israel into a strong nation. No, he wasn't about the kingdom of Israel. It was about the kingdom of God. He just came to destroy sin. And so when they were looking for this lion of the tribe of Judah, remember they asked him in the book of Acts, hey, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That wasn't his purpose. That wasn't his mission. He was reminding them, I'm not coming as a lion. I'm not coming to destroy nations. I am coming to bring in the kingdom of God, to bring in that kingdom of mercy. Why am I there? Is that the right slide? Okay, that's the right slide. Um, all right, I'm at the wrong direction. Never mind. So the disciples were, accepting, were expecting the Lion of Judah. Jesus' scars were there to make the point that he had come as the Lamb of God. So what is the kingdom of heaven that he was ushering in? Um, that's interesting. Okay, so they were saying the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. His scars would remind them that he was ushering in the kingdom of heaven. So what was the, um, the, the, uh, the kingdom of heaven that he was ushering in? Well, this is what Connie read this morning. Um, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the lion will lie down with the goat, will live the lion will lie down with the goat, and the uh, calf and the lion and the yearling will live together. Um, and the footnote there under the yearling could be the lion, the calf and the lion will eat together. So 
I don't know, have any, has anybody heard this misquoted? Because a lot of times you hear them say, the lion will lie down with the lamb. Yeah. And wouldn't that be convenient since we're talking about the lion and the lamb? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says something that's even more beautiful. So let's look at it bit by bit, okay? So the wolf will lie down, will live with the lamb, the le leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the year and will live together. Now let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah talking about the judgment of Jesus. Therefore, a lion from the forest will attack them. A wolf from the desert will ravage them. A leopard will lie down near their, wait near their towns to tear into pieces any who venture out, for their rebellion is great and their backslidings is many. Yeah, so you got there, right? You see where we're going. So God's judgment for sin is expressed by the wolf, right? The leopard and the lion. So when they were talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah, when God comes back like that, he's coming back in judgment. He's coming back with the sword. He's coming back to execute judgment. But what Jesus did, okay, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 3, say to the Israelites, take a male goat, so let me read through, take a male goat as an offering, a calf and a lamb, both a year old and without defect. So we've got the lamb, we've got the goat, we've got the calf, and we've got the yearling, right? Jesus is coming to take away the wrath of God so that where the lion of Judah is, there is also the calf, there's also the lamb, there's also the goat, there's that yearling, yearling that God is providing uh, the restitution, God is providing redemption so that we don't have to face the, the wrath of the lamb. Just a beautiful passage of scripture, and you guys know I'm not a preacher, right? I'm a teacher, but this is the kind of thing where I really need to be a preacher so you can say, yes, amen, hallelujah, let's go, come on. I wish I had that kind of emotion, but this is just one of the most beautiful, I mean, don't you just love scripture? Don't you just love the fact that these things line up one-to-one? -one? You've got the sacrifice, and you've got the wrath of God, and they're both characterized in that passage. And here we see Jesus coming back as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, just as John the Baptist said, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So you guys got it, but it's, it's in my notes, so we're going to do it anyway. So the um, earthly kingdom is the kingdom of God's judgment, right? The heavenly kingdom is God's redemption. And where we have the lion, the leopard, and the wolf as uh, instruments of God's judgment, here we see the goat, the calf, the lamb, and the yearling, all right? Jesus coming back to usher in God's redemption. So they weren't expecting that. They were expecting to see the judgment, um, but they, were, they um, did not see, or sorry, they were expecting to see the lion not recognizing that this was the kingdom of heaven that God is talking about. Okay, getting confused with my words. But the important point there is um, verse 11. Can't be verse 11. Verse 41, maybe? I don't know. But in that passage, remember when we read, he opened their eyes, he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures, right? Now we pray, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Open my mind that I can understand wonderful things in your law. Maybe we'll start doing that instead. But that's what Jesus did. And that's what God does when we read the scripture. Because I've read that passage in Jeremiah all my life. I've read the passage in Leviticus all my life. I've read Isaiah chapter 11 all my life. But I never put those things together until God opened my eyes to say, yeah, when, he's talking about, when I'm talking about the lion, the leopard, when I'm talking about all of these things, the wolf, this is to show God's judgment on the earth and the God's um, redemption, the redemption that God has provided. So thank the Lord. The, the scriptures are so rich and they're so full. We need to make sure that we are praying before we read, praying and reading with the expectation that the Spirit of God is going to show us, is going to open our eyes, is going to open our minds. All right. Um, so the disciples looking for an earthly kingdom. Uh, Jesus brought in the kingdoms of heaven. So those who are earthly minded are looking for God to destroy their enemies, right? And that's what the Israelites were looking for, or that's what the disciples were looking for. Are you going to restore, restore your kingdom? Are you going to destroy these Russians who have been oppressing us? And that's what we can get, the trap that we can get into when we are in difficult situations. You know, Lord, you got to get this boss off my back. You got to get the city of Philadelphia off my back or the creditors off my back or whatever it is. But God's will <clears throat> is always to redeem our enemies. That's why he came. That's why he came as the, the lamb. And if we are going to usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it, as it is in heaven, it's not just changing our attitude about who God is, but it's changing our attitude about who our enemies are, right? God is not willing for any to perish. He wants all to come to redemption, and that needs to be our goal in the, as well. So our attitude in the middle of bad times changes the moment we start looking at things from God's perspective. Again, going back to the story of Joseph, he didn't look at himself as a victim. He saw himself as being in the middle of God's presence. And we can live in... Um, defeat, or we can live in victory. 
And it all comes down to how much we recognize the presence of God in the middle of those circumstances. Are we looking? Are we, um, God is there. Are we available to see him? So again, we need to have our minds open to understand Scripture. All right, verse 45, that's where it is. I don't know why I put verse 11 up in there before, but if it says 11 in your notes, make sure, please, that you put verse 45. All right, we need to ask God to open our eyes and give us the wisdom to understand his Scripture and give us the wisdom to understand his, um, the, our circumstances, the things that we're in. Lord, I can't see why I'm going through this, but I know that you are here. Show me your face. Let me see your glory. Let me see who you are in these circumstances. And oftentimes God will respond um, by opening our eyes to Scripture. All right, final point. Jesus told them, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Okay, so we asked, why didn't they recognize Jesus? Why did Jesus come, with, come back with scars? The next question is, why did the disciples have to wait? And I think you know why we're asking that question because so many times we ask, why do we have to wait, right? Everything in Scripture had been fulfilled. He could have sent the Holy Spirit. Why did he tell his disciples that they needed to wait? Um, all right. So the disciples weren't ready for Jesus' mission. So here's the part where I tell you about my pathetic single life. Before I met Candace, I went through... A really bad breakup. And again, this is really pathetic. Like, I went through the phases saying, oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, can I get her back? You know, what am I going to do? Why, can, why did she break up with me? Uh, what I, and then after that, I just need somebody. Everybody's got somebody. Why can't I have somebody? God, please give me somebody. And finally, I got to the point where I was happily single. I was com comfortable in who I was, and I recognized that I didn't need anybody else. And that's when God brought Candace into my life. Now, if God had brought Candace in my life when I wasn't ready, it would have been horrible because I'd be thinking about, oh, remember my ex? Oh, you know, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so desperate to have a relationship. We've got to make sure that this, I know, try to make things happen too fast. Who knows how long things would have lasted with Candace and me if it had been sort of a rebound thing. But God didn't bring us together because we weren't ready at that time. So God didn't bring us together until we were ready. The individual's disciples weren't ready for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, Candace and I, when we got together, we weren't kids. We weren't like kids in high school where everything is, oh, this is the person I'm going to marry, you know, and then a week later we can't talk to each other. And, you know, we were old enough to know what we wanted out of a relationship and who we were and what we were bringing to a relationship. And yet, we didn't get married right away. God brought us together, right? It took some time for us to get to know each other. It took some time for us to learn how to fight with each other, how to make up with each other, right? So it wasn't just that we as individuals weren't ready, but we weren't ready as a couple. We had to mature together before we were able to, um, to, to uh, move forward into the area of, message, of, of marriage, right? So the disciples as a group weren't ready. Part of the reason that Jesus had them wait was because they needed to coalesce. They needed to become one. They needed to become united, all right. So sometimes when we're waiting, uh, I'm not going to jump ahead. I'm going to go in the sequence that we're supposed to go. Um, but yeah, this is, these are the circumstances that we face. Okay. So for example, when we started, when we re relaunched this church, we didn't have a music ministry. And it was a while before we found one, right? And we were praying for it. But God was getting us ready, and God was getting Mr. Victor ready, right? Now, sometimes God has all the pieces in place to say, oh, God, we've got the worship team, you know, we've got the, um, the, the teaching team, we, we've got, you know, all the programs. And all well, we as a, as a church need to be stronger together. God wants to bring us together, and we have to develop as a team. We as a church aren't ready as well. But there's one more thing I want to point out. If Candace and I waited until we had the perfect relationship, we never would have gotten married, right? We're, it's going to be 23 years uh, next month. We still don't have a perfect relationship, right? There's still some bumps in the road, still some things we have to work out. But at some point, we had to take that jump. You know, if we waited until we were ready to have a kid, we would never have had a child. But all of the years that we've enjoyed with Allison, all the years that we've enjoyed with, with, with um, being married, right, that was because even though it wasn't perfect, we went ahead. So God knows when we're not ready, but being ready isn't the same thing as being perfect, right? The disciples didn't have to be perfect. If we are looking for perfection, we're never going to move forward. And the sad thing that happens in the church is people are looking for the perfect church, and they say, well, this isn't it. And they go and find another church, and that's not, not an, a, a perfect church, right? So they, you know, bounce around from church to church looking for that perfect situation. It's never going to exist. At some point, we have to move on. 
And the other problem about chasing perfection, and is this the next slide? Yeah, for, so if we're waiting for perfection, we're going to get discouraged and we're going to quit. I'm not perfect, I'm not perfect yet, I can't do it. And the other thing is, we're never going to move ahead in ministry, right? So we say, hey, um, Margo, do you want to teach a class? Oh, I can't teach a class. Uh, I have so much to learn, I'm not perfect, I, I don't know the scriptures of God the way that I should. We're never going to progress if we're waiting until we're perfect. And we're never, as a church, going to be able to go out and do God's mission. You know, well, we can't support missionaries because we've got so many needs in our, in our own church. You know, we can't go out and evangelize people because what if they become saved and they start to ask us questions and we can't provide that. If we're waiting until the perfect opportunity, we're never going to go. And the disciples weren't perfect when the Holy Spirit came down, but they were ready, and God knew when they were ready. So we need to trust when God starts to move, even if we don't feel that we are ready, even if things aren't perfect, that this is God's time and we have to go ahead. God's not going to send us out when we're not prepared. God's not going to send us out when church isn't prepared, but some of that preparation is actually going out in the field and actually doing those things. So how do we respond? Well, as always, we look up towards God, look down at our feet, look to the left to those who aren't serving God, to those who don't know God, and look to the right to those who do know God. So let's look up towards God. Do we see God and his kingdom? When we are in good circumstances, when we are in bad circumstances, do we recognize God there? If you're going through difficult times, I want to challenge you. Look up and see that God is there with you in those circumstances. Don't ask, why is this happening to me, or is this something that God did to me, or something that I did? Just say, Lord, let me see you in the midst of these circumstances. And then do we have that expectation that God is going to speak? When we pray, do we expect that God is going to answer? In those circumstances, are we looking towards God? Look down towards your feet, all right? Are you in that time of pruning where God is cutting back some of those things and it's painful? If so, um, just ask God for patience. Just ask God for endurance. And work with God, all right? Don't try to hold on to those things that God is trying to take out of your life. If you're waiting for God's promise, you know, like we as a church are waiting for God to, to equip us and to send us out and to, you know, move into, into mighty areas— just pray, Lord, how can I align with your purpose? This is where I am right now. How can I get closer to you so that I'm not standing in the way of the things that you want to do? And if God's calling you and you're afraid because you're not perfect, just trust in God. Ask God to give you that faith that you can move out wherever your feet are now. Say, I'm not going to be there tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to be making steps towards the direction that God has called me towards. All right, look to the left towards people who don't know God. Do we see them as our persecutors? Or do we see them as future brothers and sisters? Now, Paul was going around dragging people from their homes, having them taken to court and killing them. And somebody, if nobody else, Stephen was praying for him. He said, Lord, don't let this sin be held to their account. Somebody thought, you know what? This guy with all that zeal, he would make a great Christian. Think about the person who's done you the most harm in the world or the person who's the biggest, you know, thorn in your side and think, man, that person would be a great Christian, right? We need to have that perspective. We need to recognize that it's not the kingdom of God coming in judgment. It's the kingdom of God coming in redemption, and he wants us to be a part of that. Are we blessing those who persecute us? You know, when um, Joseph was, a, was a, a slave in Potiphar's house. He was blessing Potiphar so much that Potiphar put him in charge of everything. He was blessing in the prison so much that the prison, uh, the head of the prison made him, put him in charge of everything else, right? Are we being a blessing to those who persecute us? That's what Jesus said. Love those who hate you, bless those who persecute you, all right? So towards those who don't know the body of Christ, who aren't part of the body of Christ. And then look to the right, people who do know God, Who's on this journey with us? What's the team that God has called me to? You know, if God's calling me to um, a music ministry, who are the people on the music team? If God's calling me to a women's ministry, am I staying in touch with the women? Am I making sure that we're encouraging each other? Am I lifting them up? If God is, you know, giving you a love for children, how are you blessing the lives of those children, right? If God has, has called you just to be that, that faithful servant, if God's calling you with the, the gift of Christina to be here every time this church is open, right? Are you encouraging people? You know, every time you see Christina, she's got a big smile on her face. She's always happy. Man, that's what God wants us to do. That's how we bless the body of Christ. So wherever we are, whatever our circumstance, are we expecting to see God? Do we see him? And are we proclaiming him? Are we part of his mission? Lord, we thank you so much that you are with us. 
even in those times when we don't recognize it, even those times when it's hard to see you. Lord, I just pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our mind, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would speak to us through others in the body of Christ, that you would speak to us as we pray and as we come before you, Lord God, that we would have a clearer vision of who you are, a clearer vision of the kingdom of heaven, and that your kingdom would come on earth at Resurrection Life Church in Tioga Nice Town, in our lives in the way that it is in heaven, that you would be glorified and that many, many people would come to know you. Amen. Amen. We come to the point of our service where we take communion today. I'm going to read the passage from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul writes, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, I'm sorry, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And I'm going to just give some instruction on communion this morning. Sometimes when we read about um, drinking unworthily, right, or coming, and I used to be afraid of that passage when I was a child, to be honest. But I think it goes back to what Otis taught this morning. We are worthy to come and take of the communion when we understand and we see Jesus for who he is. If we follow Jesus and we recognize that he is the king and he is the lion and the lamb, he's all of that, right? And then in that reality, we walk and we live, not just some mental um, understanding, but this, we've been transformed by that truth, and we see ourselves as broken and in need of a Savior. If we live in that and we see that, then Jesus says, come, because you're celebrating what I've done, right? You don't come. To be worthy doesn't mean that you have it all together, right? To be worthy means that you know you don't have it all together, but you trust in the one who does, amen? And when we come together as a body, and we do that to, to, as a body, we remember Jesus, but he transforms us to see others on our right and the left in the, in the proper way. Amen. So this morning, if you would stand, Otis, um, we'll have the communion. You can come. And if, you, if you're taking communion, we do ask to children that you have that conversation with your parents and that it's a serious moment when you're taking communion because we're remembering what God has done, right? Um, but you can come take communion. If you're not ready and you don't know, that's fine too, right? There's, there's no judgment and there's, there's no shame. It's just about being cautious and careful. Amen. Take the elements. You can hold them. We'll stand here together. We'll take them together this morning. Wait till everyone is served. Takes a minute to open them, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus took the body, took the bread, and he broke it. He did that before the resurrection at the Lord's Supper, and he did it after the resurrection. Remember, he took to his disciples. They didn't see him, but then when he broke the bread, they recognized him for who he was. Today, we break the bread, and we remember that by Christ's body that he suffered on our behalf, and because of his death, he has conquered sin. Let us take the bread together. And we also remember that by his blood, our, our sins have been purchased, our, our forgiveness has been purchased. And that not only that, that he is conquered, right? He is the lamb who was slain. Right? And even those scars are on him today because this is his kingdom and his work. Let us take the cup together. And let us just remember, let's just begin to praise the Lord and to thank him for what he's done. Lift up your voice. Um, Lift up your voice. Oh, Lord, you are the lion. You are the lamb. Worthy, worthy is the lamb. You have purchased salvation not only for us today, but one day before the throne, every nation, tribe, people, and language will proclaim 
that you are the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And we will worship you in all of the fullness of your glory. Oh, God, teach us to look forward to that day and to worship you until you come. Amen and amen. Shall rejoice in everything you have put your hand to, because the Lord your God has blessed you. 